Hello and welcome to What the Tech from Boast AI, where we talk with some of the brilliant minds behind new and exciting tech initiatives to learn what it takes to tackle technological uncertainty and eventually change the world. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Josh Gray, co-founder and CEO of Artemis. Artemis helps businesses operationalize data in marketing, sales, finance, engineering, revenue, and operations. It's a tall order, but his team and technology ultimately empowers data analysts to work with data faster by providing a low-code editor where they can visually explore, build, and automate data cleanup using pre-built logic they can drag and drop onto a canvas. So along with creating a powerful business intelligence solution, Josh and his team are also amazing networkers. We met up with them briefly during Startup Fest and Founder Fuel Demo Day back in July. We'll chat about our experience at the show, including if I recall an impressive fundraising round from Josh and his team, as well as Josh's founder journey and what it's been like building Artemis. So without further ado, Josh, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Paul. Really appreciate it. Awesome. So Josh, I know that we met face to face a couple of weeks back over at Startup Fest, but I'd love to know a little bit more about you personally, how you got into the community, how you found your way to Founder Fuel, and how you found actually the team behind Artemis in the first place. Yeah, it's a, it's a long journey. It's something that happens organically over time. Uh, it's really hard to plan out. You know, looking back, everything aligns, but you know, in the moment definitely can feel chaotic. So Really, I mean, founding team side, my co-founder and I have actually known each other since middle school. So we go way, way back and I'd stayed in touch throughout the years and I'm really connected in the past year and a half talking about this idea of, you know, working with data and making data accessible for teams and accessible, you know, for data analysts. Really how I got in the space was that I had a startup before this, which I was able to actually scale and was able to get acquired last year, which was awesome. It was an amazing experience. And from there, you know, I was able to really dive in head first into Artemis, build it out the first year. We introduced the Founder Fuel through someone in the ecosystem, a VC, someone who we, I really appreciate. She's been a number one support for a long time. The rest is kind of history after getting to Founder Fuel through that grueling process and going through the program and meeting awesome people like you at uh, Demo Day and, and Startup Fest and so on. That's so cool. Yeah, we were very excited to hear your story. We also were really impressed with the true business intelligence solution that you guys mm-hmm. put together. I'd love to know what brought you into, I guess, making something that's so business focused. I know a lot of us startups come from something that's usually a little sexier on its face than getting the data integrated into one place. But I know, at least on the both side, because we are founders in our own right, this is the kind of solution that really moves the needle for businesses like ours. So what kind of got this on your radar? What were the specific challenges you were trying to tackle in building Artifest? Totally. So, you know, as I kind of mentioned, I had a startup previous to this. It was in the e-commerce space. Right when COVID started, my co-founder and I essentially put 10 local products into a box, delivered to your home. The whole concept was stay home, support local. And that really took off. So we, you know, launched on the Friday COVID started. And so I think we sold 100 units the first week and then 250 the next week and 400 the next week and so on and so forth. That startup was really scaling aggressively. And, and a part of my role there was back in infrastructure. I was managing, you know, hundreds of deliveries a week. I was managing finances, payroll. Um, and at the end of the day, I had to use data to understand how we were scaling, how to be more efficient operationally, how to understand where our customers are coming from, where our revenue is coming from. And for me, understanding that from the founder perspective was really important because it just showed me all the problems along the typical journey of either an analyst or someone working with data, the difficulties of how hard it is to actually answer simple questions. It would happen all the time. I'd build a report about financials and I would send it to my co-founder and all I'd get back is 30 more questions. And did you use this data set? Did you use this? Did you use the revenue from Shopify, Stripe and QuickBooks or just the one from Shopify? That's going to really impact that. It's not this simple um, idea that I had coming in, which was, oh, data is data. You sync it in from a platform and everything just fits together beautifully. And so that's really what got me attuned to this problem. My co-founder, Will, he's an engineer and he has experienced the problem on the engineering side, which was at every company he worked at, What was the one thing they were always rebuilding with? I was always having a tough time scaling data infrastructure because it was always evolving. And so this kind of laid the foundation for us to think of Artemis. And we've had to do some pivots and changes here and there. And we've learned a ton with our customers and users since we launched last October. But really, that was the genesis of what brought us into the industry. Like I said, my business was acquired. So it gave me some, some free time and some leeway to dive into a new problem. And I love it, getting that first customer 
recruiting that next hire, that's what really, you know, drives us. We really were able to rally around a good mission of making data accessible. I think a lot of data tools out there are built for really hard problems because they are hard problems. But in a way, we've kind of lost that idea of accessibility. We've just expected that people will learn, will upskill, will be, you know, that engineering level. And we want to make sure that people feel included and have that accessibility moving forward. Yeah, I, I can even relate to that kind of data being not necessarily siloed, but too complicated mm-hmm. and big to comprehend from the marketing side too. Um, mm-hmm. It's tough. It's an acute problem. And I really appreciate too that you knew it firsthand. You were a founder in your own right. You saw the deluge in a scale-up environment of information coming your way. And then, like you said too, 30 different questions would come up when you tried to deliver a specific data point. And it's not efficient. And that's very similar actually to the ethos behind what we do at Boast too. Founders should be focused on developing the solutions that they really wanna bring to market. They shouldn't get bogged down in the minutia. They shouldn't necessarily get lost in navigating huge data pools. If you can make it simpler for them, and if you can take the legwork out of something that really is a bit more administrative on the one side, and then you making it so that they can be tactical and strategic from there, amazing value. It's huge for the startup community. And also, again, I think speaks very well for Artemis. Obviously, you guys, I think, had landed a huge funding round when we spoke last yeah. time. How's that been going, I guess, since we last spoke? Yeah, so we we haven't finalized it yet, so there's lots of work to be done still. We're kind of in the middle of it. Stay tuned for some good announcements, hopefully coming out this fall. We, we were able to get some key people for our next round, which has been amazing. It's really, it's quite a process. I've been learning a ton of the investor founder process and how to find them, how to work with them, how to develop that relationship. So I'm excited for the next 18 to 24 months at Artemis is going to be really, really cool to see. So definitely excited to really put that to work. That is awesome. Now, you had mentioned your co-founder, Will, and I had met him as well during Startup Fest. Mm -hmm. And you had mentioned, too, that he is a developer at heart. He's an engineer. He Mm -hmm. comes into the actual building of the product. Could you shine a little bit of light on the R&D initiatives that you and Will have undertaken in building Artemis? To put a finer point on it, maybe, what are some of the unique integrations or unique advancements that Artemis has built into it that gives it that extra value add in a crowded market of EI tools? Yeah, totally. I think I'll preface with every startup is essentially an R&D department. Most startups, when you look at the past history of them, they were did something completely different. And they had to learn and pivot and really research and understand exactly what their customer needed, what their customer wanted from them. For us specifically, we have a ton of research, especially in the space that's blowing up right now, which is that AI slash large language model, you know, LLM space. We have the luxury of being building early enough to not be too committed down a road that we're actually able to really test and understand how is this driving business value? How is this actually impacting the user? We believe that the next decade is going to be about using data, not just storing it. If you look at the last 15, 20 years, it's all been about how do you get data from A to B? How do you store it effectively? How do you ensure that it's in the right place? This next decade is really going to be about creating and leveraging tool sets that allow you to extract that information. You always say the same data is the new oil. Well, we've kind of had to go through the process of building those plants and those refineries to extract it. Now it's time to actually put it into production and put it to use. So there's a lot of research going on there for us. How do we help teams move more efficiently? How do we help teams be more collaborative? You know, we spend a lot of time on that handoff between engineers and analysts because we want the analyst role to be smooth. We want them to be empowered. We want them to have an experience where they have fun at their job again. It's not just another tool that just has a bunch of cells and a bunch of numbers. And so investing in that experience for the user, making sure that we're taking care of them, both from a you know a job to be done, but also from the emotional standpoint of, of who they are as people. That's a very complex thing to do when building products. But at the end of the day, those are the products that are going to win. And so we spend a lot of time in that space. Absolutely. That way that you've praised that too is a very unique take. I feel like from what I've heard um, from other founders and that, like you said, it's taking care of them as people. Analysts are people. Yes, they're dealing with mountains of data, but they want that same kind of, maybe not white glove service, but like you said, comfort in dealing with the platform and actually being able to action on all of the data. I mean, we hear everywhere data is new oil, but now with AI kind of being the buzzword of the moment, I feel like that startup is exploring it in some dimension. LLMs are definitely coming up in more conversations. Could you speak a little bit to how you guys are leveraging AI? Yeah, so for us, we've really seen how our end user and end customer wants to use it. Really, again, it goes back to 
AI is an incredible tool, especially like, you know, AI is a broad word, but more specifically within LLMs, with text, the whole models behind that. We really see it as a way to completely personalize and create a unique experience for every user. We're using LLMs to do really cool things with helping users work with data in their own way, rewriting code to match their exact code style. So that way, when they're editing stuff that's maybe generated, it's in their own words, in their own language, so they're familiar with it. There's these little things that we can do that we actually can prepare and build a completely personalized and really intimate experience with the user that we're really trying to leverage. I think there's a ton of cool ways that we've seen text to SQL and natural language prompts and those ways are really dropping that barrier. We really see ourselves as that infrastructure layer before that, that helps analysts clean data faster, more effectively. So that way, when they connect an LLM, that LLM or AI tool has the right context for that. And there's a lot of stuff happening under the scenes. Totally. Yeah. And that's another thing that I think makes the powerful startups that are using AI unique in that they're delivering those intimate experiences. Honestly, I'm sure you can use AI to just kind of make your product the shiny new star on someone's roadmap. But when you're actually delivering something that's personalized, you know, using it to do very actionable outcomes for that person, that is a very effective way to fold it into your startup, I think. So totally, that, totally. Now, taking it a little bit into the funding realm a little bit more, I know mm. you've worked with Boast, I believe. And yeah. if you haven't, I know that you have also done Shred in the past. Could you maybe give me a little insight into, I guess, how powerful non-dilutive funding has been in getting Artemis to the scale-up position that it is today? Yeah, you know, startups come from a world of a lot of uncertainty. And with that, bringing together financing from a variety of places is important. I think a lot of founders today look at venture capital as the only vehicle to get money and to scale. But when you really look at the numbers on how companies come to be, a lot of the time it's not, um, or it's using you know a portion of venture capital with another portion of non-dilutive funding. It's one of those things that actually, funny enough, I think AI is going to really disrupt because sometimes non-dilutive funding can seem very inaccessible. It can seem hard to get hard to deal with. I've definitely felt that frustration, but tools like Boats and other areas and, you know, tools that potentially maybe leverage AI will actually make that process much faster, much more stress-free because we want to get back to building. As founders who are listening to this or other founders out there, they love building. They might not love the, you know, shred credit system of having to file everything and track everything and all that sort of stuff. But it's a part of the job. One of the things that we had to learn, especially through a founder fuel, was that when you're building a company, it's really easy to forget that you're building a company and focus on building a product. But you need to remember to build the company in tandem or else even if you build an amazing product, you're going to be playing catch up and there's going to be big cracks in the foundation. And so that's been something that we as a team have had to really step back with over the past four months, which is how do we make sure that we're building a company and not just a product? And how do we make sure that that company is actually developing that product in a way that's scalable and sustainable moving forward. And quite honestly, leveraging tools like Bose and other tools as well help make that a reality. I love that. Title of episode just dropped there. Build a company, not just a product. I think that's something that founders really need to bear in mind. And to your point, non-dilutive funding, especially what's being offered in Canada, whether it's the Shred program or it's the IRAP grants or anything like that, mm -hmm. it helps you make sure that you can Get that talent that you need to build the company and keep them and retain yeah. them. Even when you're in that pre totally. or even when you're just growing and it's like there isn't revenue to help build out your runway yet. You're getting that MVP product off the ground. Non-dilutive funding plays a huge role at that phase when they're on a lot of other avenues. So that's really cool to hear. Uh, so I'd love to know on that note, what's your take on the current state of startups, I guess? I know it's, mm -hmm. like we had said, it's summer. We were talking about how the misconception, I think, is that things go quiet in August and things mm -hmm. go quiet in July. Definitely not been the case on our end, but I know that we're battling some headwinds, I think, when it comes to VC funding in some realms. And there are other challenges out there, but I guess what's your take on the scene right now and What's maybe some advice you'd give to fellow founders navigating the scene today? Totally. I think there's a lot of thought leaders out there who talk about this space, what it means. For us personally, we believe there's no better time to build a startup than in a, you know, in a recessionary or in a down period. And there's a few reasons for that. One is it forces customers to be focused. One of the first things that we saw obviously dry up as the economic headwinds changed was customer interest, but also customer dependency. Um, and what I mean by that more specifically is the customers that were there that were interested that didn't really need the product, but were kind of on the fringe, 
no longer needed or had the time or the capital to actually invest in these projects anymore. And so we noticed that our pipeline, for instance, got super focused and really, if anything, a lot richer um, in context, which was a huge benefit to us at the end of the day. I think too, if you're able to build in a time like this, you have to build in a way that is more sustainably aligned. It's more aligned with revenue. It's more aligned with how do we build a business that's going to scale past unlimited VC funding. And having that mentality from the start puts a lot of things in play that if it weren't there, it's hard to catch up with. You know, there's certain business fundamentals that if you get over your skis, it's really hard to get back on track. And so we take this as obviously a harder time, but that's part of the startup challenge. You know, it invigorates us. It gets us fired up to build in a time like this. And it's still incredible to see the innovation. When you look at the last recession in OA, some of the biggest names came out. I'm pretty sure Dropbox came out in that time. Uber came out of that time. Some of the biggest data companies today came out of that time. A ton of innovation happens during these periods. And so we're hoping that we can be a part of that. And, you know, maybe be one of those names of the next period that people can call on. But yeah, we see it as a great time to build. That's so cool. Yeah. And I couldn't agree more. You listed some of the names that were coming top of mind to me when we were thinking about the last recession, like Airbnb, Uber, you hit the nail on the head. Those were ones that also created new business models out of necessity. The product necessarily wasn't something that those platforms owned. They didn't buy the cars. They didn't buy hotel space or real estate. Totally. They created a solution that was innovative at a time where it could really work and it got people thinking differently. So I really, really echo that thought that these challenges kind of just invigorate innovative thinkers to come up with those new solutions, come up with those new ways of doing business and bring them to market. And I totally sure. agree that Artemis is going to be there when we're talking about this in a couple of years. Hopefully. So on that note, what's on the roadmap for Artemis? I know that you mentioned we'll probably have some big funding announcements, crossing fingers. We've been building some really cool products with our customers. You know, we're so grateful to have a number of pilots and a number of users who really believe in the mission that we're trying to accomplish, who really believe in what we're trying to build and are so open to giving feedback, constructive criticism. We're really excited about what's coming out. We have some really cool features on products that we're going to be launched over the next you know, nine to, to 18 months that we really believe are going to help teams work with data faster and easier. Our mission, it really comes back to making data accessible for people. We have really built and oriented our roadmap around that. And uh, I, I can't say too much, but I, I do want to say that I'm really excited. I'm definitely feeling like this is going to be a great few months. So we're excited to, to get it out into the world and hopefully start changing people, um, how they work with data, how they understand it and start acting on that mission. That's awesome, Josh. I'm so happy to hear it. And I love that you also mentioned something that I think is very close to heart for us here at Boast. It's working with those customers. It's really tapping into your community, those people who are on the pilot program. Getting their feedback and working with them to make the best possible product is really a wonderful strategy, especially at the phase that you guys are at. So I'm so excited for you guys. And I can't thank you enough for joining me, Josh. Thank you so much for having me, Paul. I really appreciate it.